Welcome back, Boils and Ghouls. In 1999, Stan Lee issued a shocking open letter to the press without warning, seemingly containing concrete evidence of what most people have believed all along. Quote, to whom it may concern, I have always considered Steve Ditko to be Spider-Man's co-creator, end quote. As a younger man, I applauded Lee for going out of his way to point this out. From an outsider's perspective, Stan Lee had nothing to gain from admitting that Steve Ditko was the co-creator of Spider-Man. To the best of my knowledge, they hadn't even spoken in 30 years. In turn, Steve Ditko self-published a number of lengthy, contentious essays about how everything that Stan Lee did, including the Spider-Man letter, was just all wrong. It was all just a long con, with Lee playing at an endgame no one else seemed to be able to see. Frankly, at the time, I thought Steve Ditko was crazy. Some considerable years later, thousands of pages of interviews and innumerable books on the subject later, I'll simply say Ditko seems a lot less irrational than he used to. Join me for another of comic's greatest mysteries, that of Steve Ditko, Stan Lee, and the Spider-Man co-creation letter. Truly, one of the greatest stories never told. In 1999, Stan Lee issued the open letter about Steve Ditko being Spider-Man's co-creator, seemingly out of the blue, where at first glance, Lee appeared to have plainly stated that Steve Ditko was the co-creator of Spider-Man. From most outside perspectives, this news literally came out of nowhere. Ditko hadn't threatened legal action, and as far as most people knew, Steve Ditko and Stan Lee hadn't been in contact since Steve Ditko's departure from Marvel Comics in 1968. To a lot of us, it looked like Stan Lee just wanted to set the record straight, make sure Steve Ditko got his just due. In fact, what had apparently precipitated this bombshell was Stan Lee's seemingly inconsequential reminiscing about the Amazing Spider-Man title during an interview for the Overstreet publication Comic Book Marketplace only months prior. In the July 1998 issue 61 of the comic book marketplace, Stan Lee was asked about one of the most famous moments in Spider-Man's history, issue 33, specifically about Spider-Man being trapped underneath a water tower and spending considerable and valuable page real estate getting out from underneath it. This sequence has become legendary, consistently voted by both fans and critics as one of the most important moments in comic books, and it's even often pointed to as one of the visual benchmark achievements of the comics medium. During the interview, it so happened that Lee recalled how he, quote, just mentioned the idea, but didn't think of dedicating so many pages to it, end quote. While taking credit for things he may or may not have done, unfortunately seems to be the largest part of the legacy that Lee's left behind. After 30 years of veritable silence on the subject of Spider-Man and Marvel Comics in general, this remark would set Steve Ditko off and start a chain reaction of events culminating in the Spider-Man co-creation letter. Steve Ditko, in fact, actually wrote a letter in response to the Comic Book Marketplace interview, which was subsequently published only two issues later in issue number 63 of October 1998. And this wasn't some off-the-cuff remark either. This was a well-thought-out and penned response of great umbrage to Stan Lee's having taken credit for the plot to Amazing Spider-Man 33. The intention of the letter is seemingly clear enough and plainly stated. Steve Ditko seems to just be setting the record straight. I, Steve Ditko, was publicly credited as the plotter starting with issue 26. The lifting sequence is in issue 33. The fact is, Stan Lee or I, Steve Ditko, had no story or idea discussion about Spider-Man books even before issue 26, up to when I left the book. Stan Lee never knew what was in my plotted stories until I took in the penciled story, the cover, the script, and Saul Brodsky took the material from me and took it all into Stan's office, so I had to leave the office without ever seeing or talking to Stan." End quote. 
Obviously, Stanley had nothing to do with the contents of Amazing Spider-Man 33 and wouldn't have even known what was going to happen in the story until Steve Ditko dropped off the finished pages. This had been open knowledge for years among fans, however, many of whom are aware of the spurious nature of Lee claiming plotting or writing credit due to his Marvel method of co-plotting books. Ditko had never in 30 years of Stan Lee's false claims and public braggadocio done anything of this brash a nature. Why had Ditko felt the need to speak out about anything having to do with Spider-Man now? Was Ditko that proud of this particular bit of work from Amazing Spider-Man? Did Ditko, after 30 years of silence on the subject, finally simply hit his breaking point and feel the need to set the record straight about Spider-Man? doubtful. I think Steve Ditko, in his own peculiar way, was himself playing at something much larger than the contents of Amazing Spider-Man 33. The comic book marketplace interview was going to be a vehicle to catching Stanley in a blatant untruth, publicly calling him on it, and using the leverage to get what Steve Ditko thought he should have gotten all along. Real co-creation credit for Spider-Man. Ditko wasn't going to let this one go, and if you know anything about Steve Ditko, then you know he was nothing short of immaculately patient and doggedly tenacious. For anyone unfamiliar with Steve Ditko's comic book career once he left Marvel Comics for the first time in 1968, which is in fact most people, then it suffice to say it didn't go extremely well. After a few years, Steve Ditko had a now nigh unknown second stint at Marvel Comics, lasting from 1978 until at least 1991, where he produced and introduced characters that would fail to find their footing for decades until garnering fan and critical herald for their brilliance, such as the wacky new warrior stalwart himself, Speedball, but most notably providing art for the unbeatable Squirrel Girl's debut in the 1991 Marvel Superhero Summer Special. Even today, there are historians and internet sleuths attempting to piece together the strange work for hire books that Steve Ditko did, often without credit, up to the 1990s. For whatever reason, during the second stint at Marvel, Steve Ditko seemed to be assigned unusually strange licensed material, like a mid-1990s Tiny Toons Adventure backup story, the inaugural issue of the Chuck Norris and the Karate Commandos cartoon spin-off comic book series, as well as a series of disappointingly uninspired Transformers coloring books. Despite two tours of duty with Marvel, Ditko not only appeared to dislike the House of Ideas vehemently, but in his innumerable self-published offerings of comics, essays, and other varied writings, Steve Ditko dissected, disputed, and eventually eviscerated every part of the Marvel Comics endorsed Stan Lee version of events regarding Spider-Man's creation. Ditko would write with unbridled rancor and seething hatred about his time with Marvel, particularly his belief that Stan Lee was a con man and a huckster out to steal credit from anyone that he could bully in his submission. Ditko was neither a man to be bullied, nor did he simply point fingers. In fact, one of Ditko's most often cited examples of Lee's duplicitous nature was the open letter pertaining to the creation of Spider-Man, but not just the letter itself. Ditko was upset in particular by Stan Lee's choice of words. Steve Ditko went so far as to, in 2008, write an entire article analyzing Stan Lee's choice of wording, battering him for being incapable of either taking or giving proper credit, even when claiming to try and do precisely that. In truth, Steve Ditko probably came off like a rambling psychotic to most anyone that bothered to read the material, or more likely sought disastrously out of context quotes. The writings come off like the rantings of a madman at points until one day you realize Steve Ditko was completely and 100% right. There's very little first-hand information available about Stan Lee or Steve Ditko from the period when Ditko first left Marvel and the Amazing Spider-Man title with issue 38 in 1968. However, the few details that are there are from pretty reputable sources, and I've spent 
decades ferreting them out. In the August 2000 issue 9 of Comic Book Artist Magazine, there's an interview with Dick Giordano. And Dick Giordano worked extremely closely with Dicko for a number of years at Charlton Comics. In the interview, Giordano inadvertently gives some of the most important information I'd ever heard about Dicko's departure from Marvel Comics completely offhand, having no idea of the short tale's importance. Quote, I went to see Steve Ditko at his studio and he came up boiling mad. He thought he was writing Spider-Man, but Stan Lee was getting the credit. And because of his new philosophy or social order, he felt it was criminal for someone to take credit for something he didn't do, end quote. In the same article, he also talked about how reluctant Steve Ditko was to take any credit beyond art when assigned work with other writers. Quote, Gary Friedrich did a few things with him and Steve seemed happy. But then when he started doing stuff on his own, he didn't want to take the credit for his writing for some reason. End quote. For me, this was one of the two main missing pieces of the puzzle. Steve Ditko didn't want the credit or the glory for himself. He just didn't want Stan Lee to have it. And he didn't just want Stan Lee to not have it for some arbitrary reason. Taking credit for what Steve Ditko perceived as, and probably in many cases rightfully so, other people's work was against the perhaps insurmountable ethical code around which Steve Ditko unwaveringly built his entire existence. The other piece of the puzzle would come in the shocking realization that Steve Ditko and Stan Lee were likely on speaking terms at the point of the 1999 publication of the comic book Marketplace 61 interview reportedly had been for years and to the best of my knowledge, shockingly remained so until Ditko's passing only months before Lee's in 2018. According to reputable sources, the latest I'm aware of being I Met Steve Ditko, co-creator of Spider-Man, which was uploaded on April 21st of 2017 to the Gary Weish Beyond Comics TV channel, Stan Lee and Steve Ditko were in at least some sort of contact. In the aforementioned video, a comic book professional named Gary Weish can be plainly seen standing outside of both Steve Ditko's New York office building, as well as Ditko's personal studio. Weish then states that he has just spoken to Steve Ditko and that Ditko and quote, Stan Lee have spoken. I guess there's some type of peaceful terms or something now, end quote. This is echoed in second-hand accounts as far back as Ditko's second stint at Marvel's comics during the late 80s by members of the Marvel staff. If this is true, which I think it most likely is, it becomes painfully evident why Steve Ditko was so hurt and apparently moved to links he hadn't felt necessary in more than 30 years by Stan Lee's comments regarding the contents of Amazing Spider-Man 33. Aside from their disagreement about stories, characters, and that kind of thing, Steve Ditko philosophically disagreed with Stan Lee about the creation of Spider-Man. Steve Ditko thought that whoever drew the character had created the character. Stan Lee, on the other hand, posited that if he had never given the idea to Steve Ditko, Steve Ditko would have never come up with the character and that someone else would have just drawn it for him. Honestly, I think they're both valid points. This disagreement, however, had been a matter of contention among the two since the 1960s when a newspaper had published what Steve Ditko at the time took as denigrating pot shots at his contributions to the Amazing Spider-Man title, while Stan Lee basically came out sounding like the genius mastermind that was Marvel Comics. Despite Stan Lee always contending that the quotes were taken out of context, I think that Steve Ditko had taken them deeply personally. In the long run, though, it didn't really matter. As John Romita Sr. would later state during a legal deposition as pertaining to Stan Lee and Steve Ditko's relationship, quote, they ended up not being able to work together because they disagreed on almost everything culture, social, historically, they disagreed on characters, everything, end quote. Steve Ditko and Stan Lee were miles apart on every aspect of their creative endeavor together. 
The difference of opinion and creative relationship between the two men had, by even their own accounts, deteriorated to the point that Steve Ditko and Stan Lee were no longer on speed speaking terms when Steve Ditko originally left Marvel Comics without even giving an official reason in 1968. If the two men had reconciled between this period and the publication of the 1999 Stan Lee comic book marketplace interview, it was likely on the notion that Stan Lee and Steve Ditko agreed to disagree on the point of who co-created Spider-Man. All these years later, after all, it was a matter of splitting hairs to some extent. On the other hand, taking credit for someone else's work or creation was as near a big as no-no as there was with Steve Ditko. Stan Lee had crossed a line and by openly taking plotting credit for any issues after Amazing Spider-Man 26, something that Steve Ditko apparently had to fight tooth and nail to get credit for, Stan Lee was once again reaping benefits he did not deserve from work he did not do. This went against the core of Ditko's personal beliefs. In short, Stan Lee had awakened a sleeping beast. I'm going to stick links in the description below where you can read more in depth about objectivism, author Ayn Rand, and in particular, the idea of A is A. For now, and especially for the purposes of this video though, in a short clip from the now out of print 1987 documentary, Masters of Comic Book Art, let's listen to Steve Ditko himself read a short prepared statement about heroes, objectivism, and the idea of A is A, in this case, Pertaining to his self-published objectivist comic book, Avatar, Mr. A, in his only public appearance that I know of after departing Marvel in 1968. To Steve Ditko, the artist is the work, and the work is the telling of the story. And to this end, he uh, would like to make the following statement. Mr. A is based on Ayn Rand's theory of justice, on Aristotle's law of identity, his definition of man, and his view of art. Aristotle said that art is philosophically more important than history. History tells how men did act. Art shows how men could and should act. Art creates a model. An ideal man is a measuring standard. Without a measuring standard, nothing can be identified or judged. But everything can be measured. Diseases and sicknesses are measured by a healthy organ or body. All measurement requires an appropriate standard. With it, one can measure down to atoms, up to the stars, and the changes in the character of a man. Aristotle defined man as a rational animal. Rationality is a potential that has to be actualized by choice and the right thinking method of logic applied to reason. The standard of measurement for all is a rational logical ruler. It objectively measures the rational and irrational thinking. A hero measures a man at his best in the worst situations. A hero is a man admired for his qualities or achievements, and regarded as an ideal or model. Aristotle formulated the law of identity. A is A. A thing is what it is. It has a specific nature and identity. The truth cannot contradict itself and also be a lie. Mr. A's black and white card symbolizes the law of identity. It identifies the two moral potentials possible, the good and the evil, and by one's chosen action, the best or the worst potential can be actualized. The card is also a symbol of justice. For Ayn Rand, justice is objectively identifying a thing for what it is and treating it accordingly. No one gets the unearned. The innocent is not penalized, the guilty is not rewarded. The card is a refusal to violate the root of justice, the law of identity, by a gray compromise, a refusal to sacrifice the good to the evil or to accept any part of the evil as a greater good. Society has its admirable people, its heroes. They are found in all professions. But hidden by the complexities of society, they are not as clearly defined, not as understood, and not as effective model as a story with two opposing forces of right and wrong in a dramatic presentation, revealing the characters' choices and actions that identify them and lead to a just ending where the hero and the right view of life wins. Early comic book heroes were not about life as it is, but creations of how a man with a clear understanding of right and wrong and more courage chose to act, even if branded an outlaw. He dispensed a better justice than a pervading legal moral one. He was a moral avenger. He was not like everyone else, not the average, the common, or the ordinary man. He was the exceptional one, the uncommon one, 
the one doing what others were unwilling to do, regardless of the opposition and consequences to himself. His success provided a better model. Through a hero, one could identify the foolish, the corrupt, and the guilty. A lead character can be better or worse than society's best model. And if a man with proven better qualities appears, then a new measuring standard for men and society is established. A hero is a model for everyone, but not everyone is willing to act at his best. A less demanding model, blending good and bad, is more comforting, easier to accept. For the self-flawed, an anti-hero provides a heroic label without the need to act better. A crooked cop, a flawed cop, is not a valid model of a good law enforcer. An anti-cop corrupts the legal good, an anti-hero corrupts the moral good. Both corrupt ideals. Both choose the flaw over the perfect. The perfect is identified and measured by what is possible to man. A perfect bowling score. A perfect response accepts the truth and rejects the lie. The perfect hero on principle says yes to a true identity and no to a contradictory one. Ruled by justice, he treats every identity as it deserves. He is the actualized potential for good in its purest form, a true moral measuring ruler. He is the most human and deserving of respect. Today's flawed superheroes are superior in physical strength, but common, average, ordinary in mental strength, rich in superpowers, but bankrupt in reasoning powers. They are perfect in overcoming the flawed supervillains, saving the world, the universe, yet help us to solve their common, ordinary, average personal problems. It is like creating a perfectly physical adult with the reasoning limits of a six-year-old. The creators of flawed ideals believe that no real difference exists between a flawed hero and a flawed villain. Both have some good and some bad in them, so they blend into a grayness where no one is better than anyone else and where the worst can justifiably claim that he is as good as, as gray as the best. If it is impossible to know what is true and to do what is right, then the flaw, the worst, will be the new standard of good. Man will be defined as a flawed, anti-rational animal, and all that corrupts and harms life will be the new virtues. Like deliberately flawed eyesight, where self-blindness is the ideal, anti-life behavior will be the new standard for living. The resentment against the perfect hero is a resentment against A is A, against the integration of truth and behavior, against the non-contradictory identity of a moral ideal, against reality and life's measuring ruler, a rational moral standard. Obviously, Steve Dicko does a better job of summing up his beliefs than I ever could. As Dicko explains in his statement, according to objectivism, truth is completely non-subjective. There is fact and there is falsity, good and bad, right and wrong, black and white. It is my personal belief that by Stan Lee taking plotting credit for Spider-Man, something he had not done and acknowledged in writing that he had not done. Stan Lee had once again opened the door for discourse on who exactly had created or co-created Spider-Man from Steve Ditko's perspective, and this time the discussion would be carried out in the public eye. In accordance with this, Steve Ditko produced the first in a series of written rebuttals to Lee's version of events within a year of the Marketplace interview. Steve Ditko offered up a detailed examination of his own perspective and opinion about the creation of Spider-Man, as well as the Spider-Man co-creation letter, over a number of titles beginning with the Tisk Tis package in 2000 and culminating with the release of the 2008 edition of The Avengers mind. With both titles seemingly picking up precisely where his reply to the Stan Lee comic book marketplace interview had ended, the basic crux of Ditko's multitude of arguments can be easily distilled from the plethora of writings into a fairly short passage from the avenging mind. Quote, what is needed to be considered? pondered, and for how long, the issue is either Steve Ditko is the co-creator of Spider-Man or Steve Ditko is not the co-creator of Spider-Man. A is A or A is not A. Is it so difficult for Lee to admit, right, Steve Ditko co-created Spider-Man with me? End quote. Historically, these articles have been largely quoted out of context and utilized as a way to denigrate Steve Ditko and, in short, make him look like a nut. I mean, it does amount to a series of articles dissecting Stan Lee's word choices, specifically having to do with a letter acknowledging someone else's artistic contributions that he didn't really have to write in the first place. That being said, 
Gecko does have an extremely valid point about Lee's wording when you think about it. Why had Stan Lee chosen to include a word as vague and extraneous as considered? Why not something more short, concise, something concrete? Why not just say, Steve Ditko co-created Spider-Man with me? Did Stan Lee suddenly not remember the events of creating the character that he had talked about a million times before? Was there someone else claiming that Steve Ditko didn't co-create Spider-Man? What was there to quote-unquote consider? In 2007, during the course of an interview for the extraordinarily important BBC documentary In Search of Steve Ditko, host Jonathan Ross pressed Stan Lee for an answer about the co-creator status of Spider-Man, specifically in regards to Stan Lee's stance. For once, you get a brutally honest and virtually unprecedented response from Lee. An answer so honest, Stan Lee admits he regrets giving it almost instantly. So honest, he then backpedals completely, explaining how he was essentially bullied into his response, which I disagree with. As we watch some short clips and excerpts from that interview, take special note of how Stan Lee talks about plotting the Amazing Spider-Man title after the comic book marketplace interview in 1999, giving Steve Ditko as much and himself as little credit possible. This interview is likely as honest and open an interview or answer about the creation of Spider-Man that anyone ever obtained, so it is an invaluable resource when discussing the topic. Trying to uncover the facts in this strange case of Steve Ditko, master of the comic arts, one other name occurs again and again, Stan Lee. For many years he was considered the sole creator of such fabulous and lucrative characters as the Hulk, the X-Men, the Fantastic Four, Iron Man and of course the Amazing Spider-Man. Now Stan himself did very little to clarify or correct that assumption and it's only comparatively recently that his co-creators have got anything like the credit they so clearly deserve. He's even gone on record to jokingly remark that he'll happily take any credit that isn't nailed down. But I'm still intrigued to find out what he remembers and whether or not he believes that Steve Ditko deserves to receive that credit as the co-creator of Spider-Man. Hi, my name is Stan Lee, and I was the head writer, editor, and art director at Marvel Comics for many years. I thought up the Fantastic Four, and it did well. So we did another book called The Hulk, and then we did Spider-Man and the X-Men, and on and on. And of course, on the seventh day, I rested. <laughs> Steve and I worked beautifully together. I think, as far as I was concerned, he was the perfect collaborator. In the very beginning, I would come up with a rather detailed plot. He would draw the strip any way he wanted. I didn't give him a complete script. He'd add a lot of things that I hadn't even thought of. As we moved along, I saw that Steve was so good at story, I had him come up with most of the plots, and he would do the story, give it to me, and then I would try to hold everything together with my dialogue and captions. Again, after a while, I wouldn't even say that much to Steve. He would just go and do whatever story he wanted, bring me the artwork. It was all something I hadn't seen before. I didn't know what to expect. He had complained to me a number of times when uh, there were articles written about Spider-Man which uh, called me the creator of Spider-Man. And I had always thought I was because I'm the guy who said, I have an idea for a strip called Spider-Man. Steve had said, having an idea is nothing because until it becomes a physical thing, it's just an idea. And he said it took him to draw the strip and to give it life, so to speak, or to make it actually something tangible. Um, it, otherwise, all I had was an idea. So I said to him, well, I think the person with the idea is the person who creates it. Anyway, Steve definitely felt that he was the co-creator of Spider-Man. And that was really, after he said it, and I saw it meant a lot to him, that was fine with me. So I said, fine, I'll tell everybody you're the co-creator. That didn't quite satisfy him, so I sent him a letter. I put it in writing. To whom it may concern, this is to 
uh, state that I consider Steve Ditko to be the co-creator of Spider-Man along with me, something like that. And I found out that Steve still objected to that because he felt, I use the word consider, I consider Steve to be the co-creator. Apparently he felt that wasn't definite enough. So at that point I gave up. I mean, we just, um, I haven't spoken to him or heard from him since, I don't think. But do you yourself believe that he co-created it? I'm willing to say so. That's not what I'm asking you. Sir. No, and that's the best answer I can give you. So it's a no then, really? Pardon me? So it's a no then. No, I really think the guy who dreams the thing up created it. You dream it up and then you give it to anybody to draw it. I mean... But if it had been drawn differently, it might not have been successful or hit, I suppose. Yeah, but then I would have had created something that didn't succeed. <laughs> <laughs> Valid point. But I don't want to... I, 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 you made me say that yes. in this documentary that you're doing, and I'm sorry I said it because... I'm happy to say I consider Steve to be the co-creator. But you can see... Uh, I, I think if Steve wants to be called the co-creator, I think he deserves to be called the co-creator because he had done such a wonderful job. As always, links to the complete interview and info on the doc are in the description below. But it is painfully obvious from the Jonathan Ross interview that Stan Lee and Steve Ditko disagreed about the creation of Spider-Man. They had since the very beginning and neither one of them had changed their minds. I had long wondered why Stan Lee ever wrote the Spider-Man co-creation letter in the first place. Almost 23 years later, I believe I now know the answer. Stan Lee and Steve Ditko were talking again. They were re-establishing contact in some fashion and Stan Lee thought that this would be a clever way to re-engender himself to Steve Ditko after the disastrous events of the Marketplace interview. The letter, though, is all sound and fury, signifying nothing. In no uncertain terms, the letter makes it clear it will legally change nothing about the ownership or the compensation for the usage of Spider-Man or any of the pertaining creations that Steve Ditko was obviously solely responsible for during his seven year stint on the title, laying the groundwork and creating many members of the iconic Spider-Man's rogues gallery that still populate the numerous monthly Spider-Man titles 60 years later. The letter is simply Stan Lee's opinion, or at least the opinion that he wanted people to believe that he had for one reason or another at that point, which is a whole other thing altogether. Steve Ditko was a brilliant man though, he saw right through it, but the letter looks great to anyone who is only half paying attention. It comes off as Stan Lee setting the record straight for no other reason than he feels benevolently that Steve Ditko is entitled, partially, to credit for creating Spider-Man, kind of, at least in Stan Lee's opinion. But we now know, even according to himself, Stan Lee didn't really believe that. He believed Steve Ditko believed he was the co-creator of Spider-Man. Stan Lee never thought of Steve Ditko, Jack Kirby, or anyone else as any part of the creation process for Spider-Man or any of the original Marvel stable of characters for that matter. When asked in the Jonathan Ross interview, what if someone else had drawn Spider-Man? Stan Lee says, then I would have created something that wasn't as successful. He laughs, I think that's true. I do also, however, have to agree that without a physical form in the sense of a defined idea on paper for something that's being created for comic books, a visual medium, the person providing the concrete version of that visual aspect should oftentimes be given equal co-creation credit. I've read a lot of interviews with comic book artists that disagree with me on this subject. I think they think of themselves more as hired guns. In these cases though, these artists are being provided with more concrete ideas and stories, if not extremely detailed character ideas that other people want refined rather than created, which is in my opinion, entirely different. According to Stan Lee, that's not the case with the creation of the original Marvel roster. If Ditko was 
independently plotting and working alone on Spider-Man before issue 26, which he obviously was, then many of the characters' origins and stories would have therefore by necessity been reverse engineered from Ditko's finished drawings, not vice versa with Lee providing defined ideas to be executed by a mindless lackey. Stan Lee is considered to be the most, or at least one of the most, important and influential comic book writers of all time, and yet, due to the Marvel method, can't provide a single verifiable written script for the work he became world renowned for and claims is his own singular beatific creation. All in all, I'm inclined to agree with Steve Ditko on this one, but I'm also not here to completely crap all over Stan Lee either. I do think that Stan Lee has some real points about the creation of characters. Steve Ditko would never have come up with Spider-Man had it not been for Stan Lee. This is despite the fact that basically Stan Lee thinks he created Spider-Man because he came up with the name, maybe, and the idea of a man able to crawl on walls. It seems like the guy who took that idea and fashioned it into the only superhero capable of challenging Superman and Batman for global recognition deserves a little bit of credit. Honestly, I think the most difficult thing for me is that Stan Lee couldn't come off of it and give Steve Ditko real credit. He might have said that he believed Ditko was the co-creator, but Stan Lee never believed Steve Ditko was the co-creator of Spider-Man. If he had, he would have come out and in no uncertain terms, he would have addressed the question forthright and given Steve Ditko co-creator credit for Spider-Man, even humoring Ditko's insistence that the wording of that acknowledgement be changed. The issue is either Steve Ditko is the co-creator of Spider-Man or Steve Ditko is not the co-creator of Spider-Man. A is A or A is not A. Thanks so much for sticking with me. As always, links to my digitally available sources as well as further reading that I have come across doing research can be found in the description below. I really hope you enjoyed, maybe even learned something. This took me forever. If not, tune in tomorrow. Totally different tale about a totally new topic. If you did enjoy what you saw, please do me a favor and hit that like button. If you really liked what you saw, do me a huge favor and Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you do that, make sure you ding the little notification bell so you keep up with these doses of trivia that I'm dropping all the time. If you really enjoyed what you saw, you have any questions about what you saw in the video, or you have a suggestion for a video that you'd like to see, please think about getting in the comments section below and letting me know. I've done some great videos on viewer suggestions so far, and I always love talking to you guys. Thanks again for sticking with me, and as always, I really, truly, and honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops, Keep reading comics.